Prepare for a rude awakening. Shalom. This is Michael Rood at the Ophel Gardens in Jerusalem. In the 23rd chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, we read of a heated confrontation between the religious leaders and Yahshua. It took place up on the top of this wall that forms the Temple Mount platform. At the end of a very harsh rebuke, Yahshua said that the responsibility for all of the righteous blood that was shed from Abel to Zechariah would come upon the religious leaders of that generation. He closed his remonstration with an ultimatum from the prophetic words spoken by King David a thousand years earlier. You will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Since he promised that we would not see him again until we say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, it would seem apparent that we should know the name of the Lord. The Lord is not a name. It is a title of nobility given to every landowner in England since the days of fiefdom. That is certainly not what King David wrote by Revelation. This prophetic statement by the Messiah is often overlooked, but the dynamics of the situation are compelling. Yahshua was up on the Temple Mount during the Feast of Sukkot with hundreds and perhaps thousands of his disciples from the Galilee region. Yahshua himself had to go up to the feast in secret because the religious leaders were already plotting to kill him. Once up on the Temple Mount, he was relatively safe because of the large number of people present. It was here, on the southern end of the Temple Mount, that Solomon's porch stood, with its airy porticos offering shade from the sun and a cool breeze for those who relaxed and shared the scriptures together. It was here that Yahshua was accosted by the religious leaders who claimed to have the authority of Moses behind them. Yahshua exposed their charade and denounced them in very explicit terms. The Greek and English versions of the book of Matthew miss this point completely, but the ancient Hebrew text of Matthew flawlessly maintains Matthew's original wording. Several early church fathers acknowledged that Matthew recorded his gospel in the Hebrew language, and according to Matthew's record, Yahshua declared, the sages and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. That is, they purport to have the authority of Moses. Whatsoever he, Moses says, do, but do not do according to the takanot and ma'asim of the Pharisees. Takanot are man-made laws which nullify the Torah, and ma'asim are legal precedents which change the Torah. Do not follow the Pharisees, because they say they follow Moses, but they do not do what Moses said to do. Yahshua then went on to address the Pharisees point by point on how they were nullifying the Torah by enacting their own religious rules and regulations. He publicly stripped them of their usurped authority and exposed their deception to the assembled crowd. Finally, he gave his ultimatum to the defanged religionist you will not see me again until you say, and he stormed out of the temple with his disciples close behind. The disciples were very uncomfortable with what had just transpired, and they attempted to change the subject by pointing out some of the recent architectural additions to the temple buildings. But the Messiah would not change the subject. Instead, he said, yes, look at all these marvelous buildings and remember what they look like because I'm telling you there is not going to be one stone left standing on top of another. All of these magnificent buildings on top of this Temple Mount are going to be cast down. The disciples were shocked. They knew that to destroy the Temple meant that the national fabric of Israel would be ripped apart at the seams. They were speechless. They did not open their mouths again until they sat down on the side of the Mount of Olives on the other side of the Kidron Valley. Then they asked, When shall these things come to pass, and what will be the sign of your return? The Messiah said, Take heed, listen up, so that no man deceives you. He informs his disciples that things are going to get tough, but 
the worst is yet to come just before he returns. There are many troublesome times ahead that will bring mankind to the brink of destruction before we finally say, blessed is he who comes in the name of... Join us in the Lester Summerall Studios where this multimedia presentation was recorded. This is Bible Prophecy 101. Now, Episode 4 in the 26-part series on the prophecies in the Feast of the Lord, the name of the one true God. The Messiah appeared in their midst and said, Shalom, Shalom, peace. And it says that he then opened their understanding in the Torah and in the prophets and in all the ketubim, the other scriptures concerning what he had just fulfilled. He opened their understanding. The word understanding in the Greek is the word synesis. And the word synesis is described in Greek literature as the point at which two rivers come together. Like in America, the Monongahela and the Allegheny come together at Pittsburgh, and at the point they come together to form the mighty Ohio River, that is the Sunasis. And it is all of our lives that we've had these different streams in our mind. All this information that's come to us all of our lives, as we've read the Gospels, as we've read the different scriptures. But what is going to happen as we now teach the Feast of the Lord, that you are going to see all those things that at one time seemed to be disjointed that you really didn't know how to put together, they will come together into a mighty river. It will change your life because you will have sunesis. You will have understanding because the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, will give you that understanding as he opens to you these very scriptures. And now, as the scripture says, the law, or the Torah, having a shadow of good things to come. It is a shadow of good things to come embedded in the Torah, in the instructions, and that is why we call this first session Bible Prophecy 101. We're going to go right back to the beginning and see how these things now will make sense as we go back into the scriptures. And we begin with Jeremiah, and in the 16th chapter and the 14th verse and following, it says, Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I will bring the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands whither I have driven them. And it says, O Lord, my strength and my fortress, my refuge in the day of affliction. In the day of affliction, in the last days when Israel comes back into their own land, it is at that time that in the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come unto the Israel from the ends of the earth and shall say. The word say is a little weak here because it is cry out in repentance. The Gentiles shall come unto thee in the day of affliction, which is about upon us, and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies. Our fathers have inherited vanity in things when there is no profit. You know, if your fathers inherited lies, then what they would pass down to you would be lies, and they wouldn't even know it. Nor would you know it, because it was inherited. It was passed down to you. Remember that... As Stephen said, our fathers received the living oracles to give unto us. There are also the Gentiles, it says, that they have inherited lies, and they will repent and cry out, we've inherited lies. We've inherited things that do not profit. Shall a man make gods unto himself that are no gods? And that's what had happened. As I began to describe Easter, the goddess of fertility, which all the rest of the world knows that this is the Babylonian uh, goddess of fertility. But yet the name Easter is spoken in churches in America when the commandment of God is, thou shalt not let the name of other gods come out of your mouth. It is a commandment. The Deuteronomy says, God says, do not learn the way of the heathen, do not learn how they serve their gods, and do so, and worship me in the same way, and do so unto me. He said, is, is an abomination, which is one of the harshest words in the entire Hebrew language. It means utterly repulsive, repugnant, disgusting, putrid, and vile. That's what abomination is. And that is what God says, if you learn the way of the heathen and do the same things and say you're doing it to him. It is utterly repulsive to him. And some will say, well, 
that's not what it means to me. Well, I don't worship you. I don't care what it means to you. What it means to God is the only thing that matters. And if he calls it repulsive and vile and repugnant, then I would suggest that you get in alignment with God and call it the same thing. And it doesn't matter what family members don't like what you're doing, unless they're God, those family members then do the will of God. Now it says, therefore, because the Gentiles cry out in repentance, therefore, behold, I, God, will this once cause them, the Gentiles, to know which means to understand. I will cause the Gentiles to know by experience my hand and experience my might, and they, the Gentiles, in the last days shall know that my name is the Lord, is what it says in the King James, but every time you see capital L-O-R-D in the scriptures, in the English language, in the Hebrew, it is always yod Hey vav Hey. It is the name of the Lord, Yahweh, the holy name of Yahweh, which is not to be spoken in vain, not to be spoken for your own glory or for your own purposes. It is the name of God, Yahweh. And it says that in the last days, God will cause the Gentiles who cry out in repentance to know his name. See, the Lord is simply a title given to every British landowner for the last thousand years. But Yahweh is the name of God. Nearly 7,000 times the name of the Lord, Yahweh, appears in the Hebrew Scriptures. But following a Jewish tradition that teaches that the name is too holy to pronounce, the King James translators substituted the indistinct title, the Lord, but they did it in all capitals so that you would know that whenever you come to that word, capital L-O-R-D, or capital G, capital O, capital D, in the Hebrew, it is always the name of the Lord, which is Yahweh, yod Hey vav Hey. So we know that when the English version says, praise the name of the Lord, what does it say in Hebrew? Praise the name of Yahweh. When it says, bless the name of the Lord, you would say, okay, I'd like to. What's the name of the Lord? Because in Hebrew it says, bless the name of Yahweh. Nearly 7,000 times it occurs, but yet we have not been taught. And all it takes is just repentance. We've inherited some lies. We've inherited things that do not profit. And God says if we repent. And that's all you can do when you've inherited lies. You can't beat yourself up for your entire life. You just say, okay, I admit it. I inherited some lies. I want to know the truth. I've received the love of the truth, and I can't get enough of it. Give me some more. I'll obey whatever you teach me. I personally believe that you'll only get as much truth as you'll obey. At the point you compromise and no longer obey, you don't need any more truth. You will be ever learning, but not able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Spend all your life learning. That's why he wants us to follow the path of obedience.